I like to record myself. It was way more subtle last semester because I had a camera. I just put it there. We don't have a camera this time. So I'm going to use my phone. I'm just going to tape it to the wall real quick. It's going to work. It's going to be working, I promise. Because it's, it's really good tape. It's like packing tape. Yeah, if I could. All right, I trust you. I got a really cool uh, recorder. Yeah. Oh, my God. You did that in order yeah, but it definitely was. Is that good? Uh, no, that's perfect. Yeah. Does it feel like you need more tape? No, I think you're good. Yeah. Oh, that's so All good. right, awesome. What'd you use? Well, I used like a little recorder last time. Oh. Was it going? Like, no. Yeah, it's going right now. Okay. Wait, is it going? What if he's like, I, I can't hey. Hey, wait, I need to check real quick. He's like, cut off. <laughs> yeah, I have a recorder because I like recording myself. Is it recording? We're good? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah, because I like to just kind of make sure that I'm doing everything okay. Because mm -hmm. sometimes I'll do things or I'll say things that I'm like, man, that really had made zero sense. Or I'll do some weird things with my hands. I just like first time I recorded myself, I would like talk like this. I'm like, man, what's going on? I'm like, I don't know what this is. <laughs> so this kind of helps me a little bit. All right, I'll give you guys whew, one more minute to do your guys' acceptance speeches. And then we'll, we'll share a little bit. Okay, and try to wrap up that last sentence that you're on. All right. So, would anybody like to share what their acceptance speech is for Duke the Dog. And your cat audience is super excited to have you, but they have doubts. They're wondering, hey, does he have my best interests? So what is your acceptance speech? Yes, Ms. Connor. I would like to break the ice. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't know what to write about, okay. but I already know that cats and dogs just don't mix, just from seeing how they act around each other. So yeah. for me, um, the first kind of uh, paragraph was really about how uh, it's amazing that I stand here, I'll post that here today, and as a four-legged features of this house, pets come together today to celebrate um, me being inaugurated as mayor again. Yeah. Um, it beats me personally that I am mayor again, considering the, the, the last time I was elected during my, my run, um, I held a large uh, feline massacre, why <laughs> troop or cat. Um, oh it makes sense to why they say cats do have nine lives. <laughs> Holy, that was a turn. Okay. You saved a twist. Yeah, well, that, that's very twisty. <laughs> okay. All right. So yeah. They got a little dictatorship yeah. going on over there. Very nice. All right. Anybody else? Let's get two more. All right, Tana, I'm going to close my eyes and you tell me when to stop. Stop. Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> 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 okay, so what are some ideas that you had in your speech? I don't know. I've never had a cat. I don't know what cats enjoy. They're, they're, just, they're just terrible creatures. <laughs> yeah, I have one. So, well, we can't read my hand. Yeah. I don't know. 
Okay, so what did you write in your speech? Um, I just felt like there wasn't any other person Okay, very nice. Okay, so kind of playing with the emotions a little bit. Yeah. Saying, okay, thank you for voting for me. It's going to be a little relaxing gig, man. Or we get some hands in everybody's houses, mm -hmm. the scratch and stuff. Okay, very, very nice. Kind of playing with those rhetorical appeals a little bit. <coughs> All right, we'll do one more. Okay, your turn, Morgan. See if we can score down somebody. All right, just tell me when. Oh, okay. Right. <laughs> uh, okay. Did you guys get nervous over there? Like, yeah. Oh. yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so I like didn't even read the fourth consecutive thing, so mine doesn't make sense to that. Oh, that's but okay. I put I have heard your meows and calling, so I know it is not necessarily fully desired that I am your mayor. However, I was raised by cats, so I have more of an understanding than you think. When it comes to your world, I too use a litter box and I will do my absolute best to get out right along with you. I am here to help you, not myself. I feel very honored to have received this position as mayor and I will not let you regret your vote. That's really, really good. And there was something that you said there that was really nice. We're going to be talking about a little bit today. Uh, we were talking about, we're going to be talking about ethos. And ethos is kind of your credibility, like why you were important. And in your speech, you said that the dog was raised by cats. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that kind of plays on, oh, okay, so he gets us. Like, he's totally a cat, man, he just looks weird, and drools and stuff. No, no, yeah, that's really, really good, and we're gonna be talking about that a little bit more today. Guys, awesome job, uh, let's pass those. I think I picked on this side of the room last semester. Let's pass them to this page. <laughs> that is your reward for helping put up my video camera. <laughs> So uh, what we're going to be doing today is talking about rhetorical appeals and understanding their terms and its rhetorical appeals. Uh, but for homework <laughs> in those journals, I had you read that article about ethos, and pathos, and logos. And what I would like you guys to do before we start talking about it is I would like you guys to get into groups and I'll allow you guys to group yourselves. Um, let's try to get them maybe four to five. If you can do four to five, get yourselves into groups and kind of discuss, uh, pull them up on your phones if you have to and discuss your journal entries and see what you guys feel like. How would you all define ethos? How did you guys assign pathos, logos, kairos? And then talk about like what real world settings did you find those? We're using what we use first. Yes, absolutely, yeah, please. If you have electronic devices, please pull those up. Yeah, on your mobile pages. And take a look at what you read, get into your groups and discuss. And I'll close this door so the ghosts don't get us. Whew. You guys can move around. No. Okay, oh no, you're good. <laughs> yeah. Now once you pick up. This always happens. Yeah, just do that and then I'm gonna um, take the picture. Okay. Um, <laughs> I've got two bachelors over here. Need some group. Some group love. Okay, okay, awesome. We got a group of five. Okay, we got you go by four. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay. All right, we got Mr. Denny, we got one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five. Oh, you guys got four? Okay, that's perfect. Awesome, yeah, you may join this group. And then we'll have one group of six, but that's okay. So we'll have a player and we'll get out in here and mix up with Caleb. Or we can do three, up to you guys. You guys want to do two groups of three? We'll do two groups of three. It's like a, it's like a perfect. Come on, capital L. Okay, so I think that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. That's so funny. 
like it did somebody, how would you guys define ethos? So in your groups, how did you all define ethos? Just take, I think it's all your email. Authority or character, persuade based on the speaker's social standing or knowledge. Okay, okay, yeah. definition. Yeah, so the ethos is that authority, the credibility that the speaker has or how or the credibility they project. So what were some examples that you all had? Um, like whenever you do a research paper, like mm -hmm. you have the credit, like your work cited page, like you have where you got everything. Okay, okay, so for now we'll put up the work cited page here. Okay, that could be something. Or if like you're telling a story about yourself and you have pictures, like you're credible. Okay, okay, so what, what about those pictures make you credible? I mean, it shows that you're not lying about it. Okay, yes. okay, so having some having evidence about you being there? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so some first-hand experience. Yeah, I think, that, I think that's really good. I think that's a good example. Yeah, what else, guys? What are some other examples that you all have about ethos? Yes, Ms. Um, we talked about how it's especially seen in um, advertisements or advertisements. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Dimash talked about how uh, sometimes you can see, let's say, a baby, or um, and they make, let's say, they make it sad. Okay. Yeah. Um, the one that I would personally use is doctors, for example. I've seen this ad that that, that talk to me about doctors, and they're like, as a doctor, I believe. Ooh, okay. Yeah. You'd be more um, open to hear what a doctor says. Yeah. Yeah, kind of playing around, getting that idea of, as a doctor, talking about your experiences a little bit more. Um, so what does a doctor look like? If we're like, okay, he looks like he's credible, looks like he's got it going on. What does that look like? What do we look for? <coughs> So appearance plays a really big role in ethos as well. Like the way that we present ourselves enhances our ethos. So if I was in you know, up here teaching you guys in jorts and my favorite flamingo Hawaiian t-shirt, like how much authority would you feel like I had in the classroom? And I, would and I was talking in the corner, like, I don't know, counting like Rain Man in the corner here, trying to instruct you guys. Like, would you feel like you're like, what's going on? Like, would you feel like you understand? Oh yeah, this is the class. This is he knows what he's talking about. <coughs> no, no, yeah. So like, we have to. There's a way that we present ourselves to help enhance our ethos. Yeah, I think that's a really good idea for now. Uh, pathos. When we get the definition for pathos, this might show. What was your definition of pathos? Um, pathos maybe you can use for like emotional frustration. Okay, yeah, have those. To convince people to actually make them help for something for fundraising or maybe. Um, okay, yeah. Some kind of help. I think fundraising is a really, really good example. Yeah, because um, we, we typically play with pathos a lot, and even small ones. <coughs> so uh, the Girl Scout cookies, which I'm just looking to love every single time. I just can't say no to those. Like the chocolate peanut butter ones, those are my favorite. They're just so good. But if you look on the back of those, they talk about what the cookies are for. So if you buy this, you are single-handedly helping all these curriculums, you're helping them get real world experiences and things, talking to people, and like, yeah, I feel aggravated <laughs> for eating this entire tray of cookies by myself. Yes? We talked about like those sad dog commercials. Yes, absolutely. The Sarah McLachlan and the Arms of the Angel commercial. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Guys, you're doing a really, really good job. I, uh, for speakers, uh, somehow when we want to persuade, we want an audience to feel a certain way. We play on their emotions, so that can be affirmation, like, hey, you're doing a good thing by giving me five bucks. Or it would be like the sad dog ones, like, 
hey, if you like go to the nearest Humane Society now, this is what it looks like in there, adopt a dog, like save their lives. You're like, oh my gosh, I'll fine, I'll take two. So <laughs> like, and we, but you can also play with humor too. If you have a point you want to reach across, you can use humor and make jokes. I mean, a really good example is my class. I try to keep my class light. Um, so to try to help transfer that information. And that's how I use my pathos in the classroom. And you gotta think about, okay, how do I use yours? So we all use a different piece. Uh, sometimes I'll be serious. You know, I feel like we might be getting a little bit too out of control. I might tone it down a little bit. So there's different ways that you can maneuver and manipulate your pathos. Really, really good job, guys. All right, what about logos? Logic. Logic, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so with logos, Reaching the audience with logic. Yeah, so what are some examples in your guys' lives where you've noticed, hey, I'm using logic on somebody or somebody using logic on me? Really talking about like sports or something, people who just have all this statistics too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a big one, guys. Like, I know a um, really big conversation right now is the Hall of Fame. Um, and the issue is, like, with Derek Jeter only getting, like, 97, I say only 97.6% of the vote, but there's a big uproar. They're like, okay, why not 100? And then they start naming off the stats of Derek Jeter, like, more than 3,000 hits, played for the same team more than 20 years, was the captain of the team, talked about some of the great, impactful plays that he made. And the argument would be a lot less if we didn't have those numbers to back it up. So yeah, absolutely. And it kind of plays that argument. Hall of Famers have these stats. Derek Jeter has these stats. Therefore, Derek Jeter is a Hall of Famer. Like using that logic to help enhance our argument. Absolutely. Yes, Ms. Tom. Um, I think Logos does a great job at um, reaching to the audience using, um, what do they call it? Deductive arguments and yeah. interested arguments. Yes. We, and I feel like this is so big, especially in our generation. A lot of people say stuff, I mean, it doesn't, Make it makes sense, but it's I don't know how to explain this. Yeah, keep going with it. Uh, for example, the pineapple thing, right? Uh -huh. I explained to you that um, <laughs> pizzas are basically a piece of crust, and uh -huh. you just put whatever topping you want on top of it. Mm -hmm. um, pineapple is a topping, therefore pineapple and pizza make sense. Yeah, that's yeah. logical explanation. Yeah, absolutely. It's just crazy, but it's logical. Yeah, absolutely. And I think and I think it's really awesome that you're kind of looking at that connection. So what do you guys think about that? That an argument can be logical, but then it can also not make sense. That that we feel pretty good about that. Yeah, yeah kinda of like uh, I don't know, your dad you're just saying, Hey dad, can I go out? And you're like he's like, No, you can't go out. You're like, Why? Like, well, because I'm the dad. And you're like, well, okay, yeah, a lot of people are the dad. And in his mind, he's like, I have the authority, so I can project that authority on you. And you're like, is, does that really make sense? And I think that's really interesting. It's something we're going to be talking about in a couple of weeks about logical fallacies. Because people use logic all the time, but sometimes that logic doesn't make sense, or it just doesn't make that point that we think it does. And we're like, okay, is that influencing me? Is that manipulating me to make me feel something? So yeah, absolutely. So how do we prove on in, uh, enhance our logic and when we're writing papers? Yes, Ms. Ashley. Well, like in a way, I feel like they all kind of play together because you could have like only logic in a paper and then it's just facts, but if you like connect like um, pathos and like, you know, trying to like create emotion with it and like how people feel about the facts and like, that makes up for a good argument and like an interesting paper or story or something. Yeah, I, I, and that's really awesome. I haven't even started the PowerPoint yet and you're already making those connections. Yeah, that's really good guys. The rhetorical appeals, we're gonna be discussing them separately, but they all come in and work with each other. So it's almost like you have logos, but those numbers really don't make sense if you don't try to reach your audience with emotion or to show your credibility. So it's almost like these multiple rhetorical appeals can either happen in the same paragraph, in the same speech, at the same time. Like the exact same word can apply for pathos, can apply for logos, can apply for kairos, can apply for ethos. I'm like, okay, how does that work? How does that function? So in this class, we're gonna try to break 
a few of those things down and try to understand, okay, what is working when? No, really, really good job. And for your informative essays, we were talking about, so in EN 100, we're gonna be applying what we learned in EN 100 into EN 140. When you're using your informative essays, what were your instructors telling you about your sources? That incredible. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, they had incredible sources. We were saying that we needed at least one from the Kemp Library database, because all those sources are peer reviewed, they are published by successful scholars, and they will help enhance your argument, or whatever logic you were trying to make. So those articles kind of apply for both, right? We're getting that authority, because if I'm talking about uh, psychology, or I'm talking about linguistics, and I bring up Noam Chomsky, they're like, a linguist would be like, oh, okay, yeah, Noam Chomsky, yeah, totally. Like, he's all, all about uh, nature over nurture, right? <coughs> And then I can help go with that with my argument. If I'm talking about baseball and I start talking about Derek Jeter bringing in stats and bringing in statistics about Hall of Fame voting, they'll be like, oh, okay, yeah, he knows what he's talking about. And making sure those sources are credible. So the work cited and the research almost kind of play to each other. Now, I was kind of listening to some groups, and it sounds like that last one 